Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and I am bringing you yet another episode that I am also looking forward to hearing and seeing. I never know what's going to be revealed, but sometimes when you get those butterflies, it's something good's a coming. That's one of these shows because we're talking about subtle energies. And specifically today, we're talking with an expert on trauma and energy in your body. I found this to be a really fascinating and frankly, very apropos subject for all times and really for right now as well. So a big shout out to my sponsors. Thank you, Dr. Dane here at Access Consciousness for believing in the show and supporting the show hmm, at least eight years. We've been on air and on podcast for going on 14 years this very summer. And so we thank you for believing in us. They do great work out in the world. You can go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com and accessconsciousness.com. Dare to Dream has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. And we rock, rack, rank, we are rock stars who rank in the very top of all of self-improvement in Apple Podcasts. Most recently, even outside of the USA, we were ranking in Sweden. So thank you, Sweden. I am a visibility coach. I run a visibility hub. What does that mean? I teach you how to write a page turner book, how to take that book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and then how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts with big results. I put together some free templates and also guided videos for you so you can learn how to use the system of media exposure. Go get yours too at debbie-dashinger.com slash message. And it's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash message. My question for you today is, can you uncover and transform the subtle energies causing your greatest hardships? My guest today is Cindy Dale, internationally renowned author, speaker, energy healer, and the author of 27 books on energy medicine, intuition, and spirituality. Cindy's latest book is Energy Healing for Trauma, Stress, and Chronic Illness. Cindy is president of Life System Services, a corporation that offers intuitive-based healing, destiny coaching, and corporate consulting. Cindy has been trained in multiple healing modalities, including shamanism, intuitive healing, Lakota medicine, and Reiki. You can learn more about her at her website, which is her name, C-Y-N-D-I-D-A-L-E dot com. And I welcome Cindy Dale to Dear to Dream. Cindy, it is so great to have you. I am thrilled to be here. I'm eager to see what we're going to dream up together. Mm, good one. Very good one. Well, I have so many places um, to go with you on this very yummy subject. So I'm going to start out with bringing in the audience so they have a good understanding of what it is you know. And so I want to start with the subtle or the invisible energies that are carried on in forces that cause these traumas. Can you talk about what that is and how that appears, especially because it seems to me you see it maybe like an x-ray machine <laughs> into somebody? Well, and I have been able to, like you're saying, see like an x-ray machine ever since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. So when I was a young one, I could hear ghosts, I could see spirits, I would talk with them, I would gauge my behavior. I was a very young codependent. <laughs> gauge my behavior, you know, based on the colors coming off my parents. So if my mom had this certain kind of red, I would just get down because I I just knew we were going to get in trouble, especially me, because uh, I could see these things. Uh, and my dad, when he came home from work, if he was this kind of, sort of funky brownish yellow, I knew he would drink at least two or three martinis. If he had a brighter yellow, I knew he'd stick to one. And when he was the brownest, he and my mother would get into fights. So I was just one of those oddball kids. And I, you know, when I was, you know, kind of about 13, I decided, you know, life is too tough. I had a near death experience. It, I really told my parents I was going to leave now and left the body. 
uh, didn't see the great white light, heard a voice that said, you haven't done anything. So I came back and I lost all those gifts until I started therapy. So as I worked on my inner issues, that ability to sense, to feel, to see in what we would call the invisible and audible came back. So honestly, Debbie, my life goal has been figuring out what that means. What's the invisible? What's the subtle? What are the forces that create uh, stress, trauma, cause us joy and happiness versus illness and inability to manifest? And, you know, I'm not unusual. We all sense these things. We all feel them. We all know it's real, except I think that finally science is substantiating it. I mean, science will tell you right now that 99.999% of a physical object is subtle. It's invisible. That's us. And so that's what I like to work with, especially around issues like stress and trauma is What's in that invisible 99% that's creating challenges? Because if you can hone in on that, your physical world can shift. Otherwise, it's pretty hard to make a change. I think it's interesting what you said. And that piece about the manifestation is curious to me. I don't know if everybody's like this, but it's at least my experience of huge, easy manifestation where many people like, how do you not only do that, but do that consistently? It's like, mm, you know, there's just no stuff there. And of course, all of us watching, listening are metaphysicians. So we understand the tenets that everybody's taught about manifestation. But I will also say then there are certain places where it is more difficult. Is this where the trauma piece comes in? Is this where there's a force that gets in the way of the flow of manifestation? Absolutely. This is where there's going to be forces and or others energies, mm -hmm. typically subtle energies that get in the way. So let me talk about forces. We can't really see forces, but we understand certain types like you get hit by a car. Right. And that's a physical force, but you don't really see the force. You just get the impact. And those kind of forces, you know, physical, environmental, there's also psychological you know, where somebody's yelling or thinking negative thoughts. There are forces that are, you know, kind of more digital these days, you know, what's happening in the EMF world. There's spiritual forces like entities and the stuff that goes bang in the middle of the night. Um, there's something else altogether I can speak to later called missing forces, but we're all impacted by forces. Typically, we don't even know they're coming at us and they often carry energies that don't match us, subtle energies, negative energies, charged energies, dad's in a bad mood, dad yells, here comes his shame, and it's in us. And that shame, we don't know that it's there. We're five, we're 10, maybe we're 15, maybe we're just born. And so think of those kind of subtle energies forming barricades. We don't know why we don't feel good enough to allow manifestation, but that's what happens. And, you know, then we have ancestors energies and we can go on and on about that. <laughs> so, you know, we're sort of these open books, but somebody else is always writing in us, especially as we're growing up. So when we're older and we're thinking our own thoughts, we don't really know what's hidden in the deep, what those messages are that are going out into the world that are saying, Cindy's saying she wants a new Porsche. I don't really want a Porsche. <laughs> If somebody gave me one, I'd take it, right? <laughs> but but maybe I'm thinking I really want a Porsche, but all these subtle energies and the forces I've collected that are staying in me or around me are are just saying, nope, 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 nope. She doesn't want that. She'll she'll take a bicycle. That's about it. So that's sort of how it works. It sounds to me when you describe this, Cindy, like coding. When you say someone is writing in our book, that's very powerful. And it sounds to me like we come out with this very unique indigenous code, maybe it's pure. And then with all the forces that we get to experience in our life, it's almost recoding and reprogramming us and is unnatural. That's exactly what's happening. I do believe we have an indigenous or an original code. And I think that when we're born or even when we go into that 
teeny tiny fertilized egg, we're also bringing some negative codes from our own past life experiences. So those are coming in. Ancestors' energies are coming in. They're not all bad. Sometimes they're absolutely terrific. And so this idea that we're a blank slate isn't quite true, but we are, we do vibrate, if you would. We are more able when we're younger to attune to our true codes and to act from them. You know, if you look, if you look at what therapists say, they, most therapists say that the top age, you know, kind of you have to kind of, you know, kind of recover from what you've gone through is age seven. And then it's just sort of downhill and a lot of work. I believe is probably about age four <laughs> that most of the real critical codes that are negative that are going to drive us crazy when we're adults have really been indoctrinated. I don't think that's hopeless. I, I believe that in our energy system, there are keys to easily replacing the negative codes, to transforming them, to transmuting them. Uh, but it's it's tough because most people don't really even know that 99.99% of their coding is probably not reflective of who they really are. Hmm. And so the keys to recoding or uncoding what was written over what should have been there, how can we heal that? How can we make that shift? Well, I've been a chakra person for decades. I don't really know how I landed there. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I was like a normal little girl. I would watch TV and go, I want to grow up to be Miss Universe or that was normal in my age, right? These days, I think that's not cool. Um, or, you know, maybe I'll be a doctor or, or whatever it is, you know, that I sort of flailed around to try to figure out. But a lot of those colors I saw when I was a kid ended up being chakras, you know, the energy centers. Now, here's a super simple way to open good codes to replace the negative ones. Every chakra actually has two wheels. I'm going to use a really bad prop um, because chakras actually look like donuts, but I can't have a donut sitting here or there wouldn't be any donuts. I would never get on a show. I would, they'd be gone, you know, and have like crumbs everywhere. So here's the donut of a chakra and there's dog hair on it too, but just ignore all that. I do clean. So the outer wheel of a chakra, now these are spinning and they're vortexing and they have energy coming in and energy going out and they're very, very busy beavers. But the outer wheel holds those codes, our, our, our negative soul karma, our ancestors codes, our um, experiential codes, the ones that are all about survival and fitting in, right? Most of the, some of those work. I mean, you really don't want to blow up a job by acting inappropriate. So you need some of these codes. The inner wheel though, has a form of light in it. It's really programmed by our spirit versus our soul, like our essence. Mm -hmm. And in there is a type of light that in science these days, it's called absolute light. It's very pure. It preceded the big bang. It's still in the universe. I, I could go on and on about it because I'm kind of a science geek, but it's the type of light that doesn't cast any darkness. Hmm. Isn't that cool? It's very it, cool. So it's a it's pure light. light. It's a pure light. It's a pure light. The light around here is more you know, kind of polarity, there's always an opposite or, you know, it's sort of funky and it's challenging and it's hard work to deal with. But in here, if we can start to identify or work with the energy in a chakra, even bring it around the outer wheel, you're starting to purify, you get farther faster and you're opening your original coat too. Okay, huge key. Very interesting. And I understand that you talk about there is a chakra that is called the soul chakra or a shaman chakra, which for me was like mic drop. I have never heard that, but I love even the sound of it. Where does this reside and what is its job? Okay, well, to me, this is fascinating because again, when I was little, you know, we really learn a lot when we're little. We just don't get to use it very often. I saw chakras, but I didn't see them just in somebody, you know, like the seven that are in the spine. I saw some that were around people. So I did experimentation with that. Once I spent my 20s, part of my 30s, really traveling, meeting with different jungle shaman and desert shaman and learning things and getting my inner sight 
kind of more finely tuned, which I'm still working on. I think it's an ongoing process. So I see out of body chakras. One, the soul chakra, kind of a mystical shaman chakra is about, I have to duck. <laughs> it's about two inches above the head. And it's just like a, it's like a pointed dot, this black or silver, and it connects into the thymus. But if you journey up through, you know, that, that portal, all of a sudden you're in and can connect to other dimensions, uh, what we typically call the Akashic records, uh, different planes of existence. There's other records up there. They're also available in the thymus, which is a really important part of the body because it has to do with your immune system. Who these days is not scared about getting or having an autoimmune dysfunction, right? I think we're cut off from our soul chakra. I think we're largely cut off from like our interdimensional interconnections. I mean, much of the world is anyway. So that's a really important chakra because it holds our history. We connect with guides. We can travel to different places and planes, uh, concurrent realities. So as you can tell, this one fascinates me. Yeah, ditto. I, I'm oof, I'm traveling with you. So is this one of, it feels like there's more, there's an end, but I'll just start with this soul chakra, this mystical shaman chakra. Just the word is so amazing. Is this where when we drink, I'll use myself, when I drink ayahuasca or San Pedro or ingest mushrooms or some kind of psychedelic in order to do profound spiritual sacred work, is this what is activated and is this also a portal by which we can experience concurrent realities and dimensions and go and see things that we are supposed to for our healing journey? Absolutely. And I've used ayahuasca many times, mainly down in Peru, in the Amazon. So, you know, it was a great experience because you're there with nature, you know, and with what they call the Pachamama, the mother. And I do believe this is one of the portals that's really being activated for the traveling. And one of my experiences, you know, when I was under ayahuasca was traveling inside of myself, like, like my body went through creation. I was a rock, then I was a plant, then I was an animal, then, you know, I evolved through the body. One of my experiences, though, I went and shot through that eight chakra to my death in this lifetime. And I just kept going <laughs> into the oneness, which I, I, I can't re-experience in the body. I, I want to, but I can't. And, but I know it's there. I, always, I also believe it. And I was up there for I don't know how long because there's no time. When you're in your shamanic, there's no time. There's no space. And then the voice, I always get these voices that tell me I can't go do all these things I really want to do. This voice, you know, I said, I want to stay. And the voice said, well, you're not dead yet. <laughs> you have to go back. As I'm coming back to my body, my body sitting on a tree trunk, like in a dark, you know, kind of jungle in Peru with mosquitoes, you know, you know, kind of bugging me. Um, the voice said, now that you've experienced your future, you're going to know the future. And I, and I started crying. Because, I mean, I'm sure you get this experience too, where you'd love to know your future. Mm. And I've always wanted to know it. And I suddenly didn't want to know it. I was like, mm. I don't want to know it. And the voice said, you're just going to know certain parts then. We'll just give you certain pieces. And I landed and then it added, and now you're going to have 10 years of darkness, which I did. So that was sort of the punctuation on that story. But um, <laughs> it wasn't very fun. <laughs> you know, so, but I think it's good to talk about that, that, we tend to think when we're spiritual and evolving that it's all going to be easy, but it's, you know, we're human. There's, there's good days. There's bad days. There's, there's dark night of the soul. There's light days of the soul. I, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced that. There's really a mix because we learn from it all. How, so you, this is, that's an amazing story. And I have, I have 17 things that come up when I listen to that. You know, part of it is because you're such a sensitive, I find it curious that you have that kind of experience, right? And 
So you're taking this beautiful, profound, wise Aya plant inside, which of course has the wisdom to lead us exactly where each of us is supposed to go. And you have this like sort of a gorgeous experience. And so I'm just thinking about what it might, might be like for somebody like you who is so aware and so sensitive and then to heighten that and open up to the potential other worlds, it seems to me it could be much more exponential than many of the rest of us. That's no judgment or better than, but you sort of already are coming quite equipped with knowledge of the other world. I think that's such an interesting point. And there's that upside that I feel like maybe compared to people who haven't had as much kind of connection to their intuition, if you were, you know, I might get brighter colors or, uh, you know, kind of more voices and more sense of everything in my body. I think we all relate to the downsides of being as sensitive as well. Um, gosh, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, you feel everything and it's a normal life. My son is a baseball pitcher and he's been going through a really tough month. So mom feels it all. Two nights ago, he didn't get pitched. I'm wherever I was traveling. I travel for baseball. I don't remember what city it was. You know, they're all the same. And cause you just sit there, right? And watch. And I knew, I, like I woke up at 2.30 and I was just full of his fear cause his mechanic he'd had COVID and all this stuff happened. And I was just full of his feelings. And I'm like, okay, Cindy, you're just going to feel all his terror and all his, you know, dismay for however long you're going to feel it. So I just lay there feeling it all. And two hours after that, I was told take a magnesium and that puts me to sleep again. It's 4.30 in the morning. I took this kind of magnesium that goes to your head. It's a little bit like ayahuasca, but it's a magnesium. <laughs> so you don't have to go to the jungle to get your high, right? <laughs> and, I, and I fell asleep and I had all these dreams mm -hmm. about him and his future. And, you know, I woke up the next morning and I thought this was really important. I'm glad I went through all that. But Debbie, I was tired. <laughs> I was tired. When we open to our spirit, when we open to these ways, there's this fine line between this is my life versus I'm allowing other lives Ugh. to, okay, see, talk about that. Thank you. <laughs> Preach. Yeah. Wow. Right. It's deep. It is deep to be alive today where there's so much that's calling to us all the time. There's electronics and there's so much stimulation and information and connection, which is all very yummy on one hand. And yet when you are a walking satellite dish, it can be um, at some level, yes, I agree, exhausting, interesting to try to delineate, this is mine, this is not mine, thank you for sharing. Uh, and definitely, you know, the, the idea of being so sensitized that my sleep often is affected when things are up without a doubt. And I look at other people who just you know, close their eyes and they hit the key and they're done. They're just done for the day until they wake up. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, so I, then talk about embracing that part of who you be and who many of us here are these, you know, these light workers, these sensitives, these people who came here for great purpose at an interesting time. Well, and I have learned to embrace it. I have learned a lot about boundaries too. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, certainly I'm more available for my children. And when I'm in a session with a client, I will feel what they're going through in my body. I will, I will sense some of their feelings, but I'm also willing to do that. And I think we need to have a willingness to do, you know, some of that merging, as long as we're also willing not to become that which is not us. Mm -hmm. So we have to let it go. Or I always use the phrase, I let things register with me, but very seldom do that. I let them become mine. Now, of course, with my children, we're more vulnerable and I grew them in my body, <laughs> right? So our cells are interconnected. I could frequently feel what my mother was physically and emotionally going through, but she grew me. So we're going to have some people where we're just, there's just more of that oneness and that exchange of energetics. 
whether we're sensing feelings or thoughts or needs or awarenesses or physical aches and pains or whatever it is. But, you know, I, I too have learned you just have to be who you are. You don't get to pick and choose. Mm -hmm. I was talking with a client about that today and she's a sensitive, oh, a young woman, high empath, really high empath. I think she's also clear audience. So she could hear. I said, don't open that yet. You're 17. Don't open it. You don't need to hear voices on top of what you're going through. I said, no, no, no. And clairvoyant. I said, but let's just keep that to the dreams. You, you don't, you don't need to see pictures either. Let's just, I said, you got enough going on. And we talked about, you know, the downsides and the upsides and how she attracts certain narcissists who beat her up and nah, 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 right. This kind of stuff. And she goes, well, can I stop being this? I go, no, you are this. You just learn wiser ways to be this and how to use those gifts to tune in better to go, no, no, that's not a person I need to know. Or, you know what? I think I'll stop this relationship before we go any further. Or I'm just going to walk away from the punch bowl right now or whatever it might be. We learn, but we don't, we don't change who we are. You know, and what a great key point you gave, because the other thing about sensitives is we're sorry, folks, but we're very powerful. We really are. And so to have sovereignty, to ha to walk into any situation, even to wake up every day and say, I will not merge, but I can register. No one needs to merge with because I think that's what brings us down. But to register and acknowledge and understand that's profound. And so. I want to use this as a segue because many people who are addicts are sensitives. Yes, they're also very brilliant. And so you earlier alluded to autoimmune dysfunctions. We don't want to get those and so forth. And yet there's been an incredible rise right now in all of this. And modern medicine is not dealing. They're not able to access or to really heal what's happening. So we've got a dysfunctional society um, how is it? Uh, talk about that level of illness because it's prevalent. Well, I find it challenging and fascinating at the same time. So some of this goes toward talking about something I call a missing force. Not every autoimmune dysfunction or addiction, but there's, or allergy, but there's a prevalence amongst people with these situations. Uh, when they're growing up, they're supposed to be getting something they're not getting. We're supposed to be getting unconditional love. We're supposed to be cuddled. We're supposed to be seen. I mean, these are birthrights that are less measurable than food or, uh, you know, being, you know, kind of having our diapers changed or whatever. Frequently, when we don't get what we're supposed to, sometimes we're given substitutes or we just take in a substitute. You know, mom gave us cookies, right? <laughs> Instead of a, you did a good job. Or uh, when we're, you know, kind of in a certain environment and we want dad to pay attention to us, uh, he only, you know, does it when we give him a drink you know, we pour as alcohol or whatever it is, but we can go deeper than that. Sometimes in these situations, mom has an illness or an emotional challenge or dad does. And we go, well, I'm not getting unconditional love. So I'll take in mom's illnesses or I'll take in dad's emotions. I'll serve in this way to get what I need. We're bringing in forces and we're bringing in subtle energies that aren't good for us. Well, those don't just disappear physical and subtle aren't so very different. Subtle energies can turn into physical. Physical can turn into subtle, right? What I'm thinking, if I start talking, it turns into physical. You can hear it. But most energy is subtle. So it lodges in the body. And after a while, you know, the body notices that there's energy there that's not good for it. So here comes the immune system, tries to kick it out. All right. Or here comes our needy self who says, I really need unconditional love. So I'm going to drink and I'm going to drink with a guy or a gal, you know, and get my needs that met, get, get my needs met that way. Or um, mom gave me cookies. So I'm going to eat cookies to get what I needed. And now I have like a full born, you know, kind of sugar or wheat addiction or allergy or whatever it is. So I believe what's underneath most autoimmune dysfunctions, chronic pain, uh, allergies, addictions are typically, um, you know, energies we took in instead of 
you know, being able to bring in the ones we wanted or energies we took in that just aren't ours, that our body's trying to get rid of. When your immune system tries to get rid of something and it can't because it's not your energy and it's subtle, guess what it's doing? It's sort of like it's trying to punch like a ghost. It goes right through it and it punches your healthy cells. Mm. There's a huge reaction in the body when we have subtle energies inside that set us up to have active microbes, to have an out of control nervous system, to have these cells called mast cells in the body, their immune cells that overproduce, that create histamines and cytokines and inflammatory responses. Mm -hmm. But I believe most of that comes back to what wasn't ours in the first place. Wow. Okay. I, I have this question. I had this question reading your book, which is, does trauma have a language all its own? I believe that music is a language. Joy has a language. Light has a language. What about trauma? Oh, you are so cool. I believe it does. And I think how we know the language depends on our own intuitive faculties, if that makes a sense. Like I'm, I'm very clairvoyant. I can do clairaudience or hear. I'm also really empathic. When I'm working with the client, I can feel the language of the trauma in them. Like I feel waves of energy that don't belong to them. And I feel other waves of energy that are more frenetic that are their wounded selves that are trapped. And when I use my clairvoyance, I see certain shapes of energy that tell me oh, there's their trapped or wounded self, or there's energies that aren't theirs. And I haven't codified all of that yet, but I believe I'm really keen and able to pick up on trauma in people or animals or even trees because there is its own language. Somebody should figure out the entire language. Wouldn't that be cool? Yes. That would be like a trauma whisperer. <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> Somebody who could literally sit with a being with a body and have this understanding, like be pointed exactly to what is and what it needs, what it actually really needs in order to be released. Oh my gosh. What a business that would be. That would be wonderful. And a lot of it isn't just about finding out what's wrong. It's like, where's the energy? Did it ever come into the person? Is it floating around? Is it trapped inside or hidden inside? Where's the energy that needs to be activated? Mm. Because if we have energy in us that's not good for us, that's not ours, then the question is, where's the energy that is ours that's supposed to be open? Because good energy can put out what's not working. It can just push it out too. So there's two sides of the language. I think there's a dark language and a light language. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I took me a long time, but I found a chiropractor here in Los Angeles who I feel speaks to bodies. He's not just the kind of guy who goes in and does five cracks and says, see you next week. He actually accesses somehow the body and seems like he has conversations while he's working on me. And then he'll make an announcement. And so he was trying to clear something in me and he said, oh, that's your mother. Okay, yeah, you're trying to heal your mother. Can we stop that? Can we? And then he you know, pressed a few things and you know, touched here and there, which were very sore, I have to say, that he even knew where to go to do that. And it's, it, it makes sense in my world. That would not be a weird thing, you know? And so I like the idea that somebody has the ability to do this, you know, to go into the matrix of what is and sort of pull out those threads that are a little bit aberrant right now so we can wholly function instead. I would guess, this is just my guess, whether he would say this or not, he has to at some level be able to sense your true self, mm -hmm. your original self in order to have a contrast too. I, I, I think some people are like, what would you call them? Indigenous whispers, to use the word you used, right? Like they just know who you really are. And so it feels like anchoring that, opening that makes it so much easier to go, oh, there's a shadow 
<laughs> All right. There's your, that's not you. That's your mom. That's your dad. That's, that's just something you made up right there. <laughs> All right. You were just doing your best, but it's really not working. So can we get rid of that now too? Hello, no one's being healed here, <laughs> but you're being taken get down. Yeah. It's really a great thing to release and become aware of. Um, it, it begs the question, so can we energetically transfer in remedies like vitamin C or a future medicine or a vaccine? Is this possible? Absolutely. I completely believe that. There's a study I read a few years ago. I don't know how clinical it was, okay? Um, but they had one person stand with vitamins and, you know, and then they did, you know, other experiments where, you know, they could test that somebody was actually quite neutrified, like in their body, they had a lot of good nutrition. And then they, they put them close enough that we would guess that their energy fields could overlap, you know, and they put them near somebody who didn't have good nutrition, who was low in vitamin B, you know, in their blood panels or this or that or the other thing. There was a marked difference when they energetically asked to send through the field from the have to the have not, there was a marked difference in the person who was receiving whatever it was, the vitamin B, the this, the protein, uh, you know, in their blood panels, there was a change. And, you know, shamans in other countries, even in America, of course, all the time, you're not always going to be able to go gather dandelions, not here in Minnesota, when you've got three feet of snow and it's 40 below, and it got to 40 below this year with wind chill. We, we don't care if it's wind chill. We just say the lowest you know, a mountain then feel macho. Um, but you can't go collect your rhubarb and your dandelions and your make your fresh chamomile tea. But shamans took care of that because they asked the spirits of plants or animals or trees mm. to send the vibration of their physical structure, the matrix and the light, if you would, of their physical structure to somebody. So I frequently work that way, not only when I'm called, but I just last week worked with a client and she needed this really complex antidote. I mean, I would never have figured it out. I knew a couple parts of it, like some Tibetan this and some Holly this. And, you know, I don't, I don't even remember flowers besides daisies and roses. Right. So I just said, well, the guides are gathering from the spirits, you know, what you need. And I can see this and I can see that. And she saw a couple things. And they sent it in. She goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that's real. Like I have energy, like I feel better. So we're 99% subtle. Why wouldn't we deliver solutions that way? I think there's an answer, which is that we're all convinced we're mainly physical. <laughs> and so sometimes we don't believe something's gonna work unless we're actually drinking the tea or holding, you know, you know, eating the vitamin or holding this or having a real x-ray. Uh, but I'd really like it if more and more of us got more convinced of the subtle reality because it's easier, it's cheaper, and it's available to all of us all the time. So what then is possible with stem cells? I have a fascination. I would love to have a head to toe stem cell body makeover, they call it. I would love to. It's crazy expensive, like crazy expensive, but I still would love to. So is this possible? Just as an example, could I invoke stem cells into my body, new stem cells to rehabilitate anything, everything? I believe we can. I mean, and stem cells, and I'm trying to figure that out too. So stem cells are mainly made in the bone marrow. The bone marrow is fascinating because it contains a lot of our ancestors' memories from an energetic point of view. It's connected to an out-of-body chakra underneath the feet, the 10th chakra, which connects to the earth and our ancestors. So, you know, I, I feel like to get our stem cells working our own way, we may have to kind of release a few programs from the ancestors. So we're not just going to repeat grandma and grandpa, you know, back down the line. The other cool thing about stem cells in the bone marrow is the first line of really it's sort of defense and attack. Let's say we get stressed, right? Trauma is just stress that gets stuck or we're stuck in the stress. When we get stressed, the very first messaging that happens in the body is there's a hormone called, 
called osteocalcin that gets turned on in the bone marrow and it floods the body and it tells the nervous system to do fight, flight, freeze, spawn, et cetera. So these bone marrow, you know, concepts are so interesting. Why aren't we energetically decreasing those ancestors' stress responses and you know, incurring our stem cells to represent who we really are and what we're really like and, you know, to recondition the body. I mean, I really believe, you know, that some of the stories in the spiritual sacred scriptures of, you know, Methuselah was 800 years old. They lived in connection with nature. And I believe they automatically, you know, let energies in to do this and had their own stem cells working for them. Mm. Okay, um, I'm going to be a human guinea pig over here. It's so interesting. You also, you're mentioning shamanism and you've traveled the world doing this, which sounds incredible to me. And also, I know that your background includes Lakota medicine. Is the Lakota medicine piece strictly herbal medicine? What is it? How do you use it in your practice? Well, I, for about three years, was able to be a part of a Lakota community. Now, I would never say I became Lakota and that I'm knowledgeable about their medicine ways. I became probably four years. I became more of a student of their practices. Some of it's herbal, though a lot of it is sweat lodge, uh, ceremony, ritual, invoking the grandmothers and the grandfathers. I had some land uh, up north here in Minnesota and I had a Lakota medicine man come and stay there and build a sweat lodge. And then he taught us and he did sweat lodges, you know, and showed us, you know, how you can call forth grandmothers and grandfathers and spirits and the great spirit and, you know, kind of, kind of understand better the animal spirits and the animal natures. And so, you know, it's a sensitive subject because I could never say I learned those ways in the way that if I was native, but I could uh, learn enough of them that I believe that my own inner nature could, um, you know, kind of better develop how to connect with nature, how to connect with ancestors. And so many times, even now, I think of ancestors so negatively. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that, but you, I mean, around our genes is this chemical soup called the epigenome. And it actually contains at least 14 generations of our ancestors' memories. And that triggers microbes on and off and emotional reactions on and off. And we tend to think of it as mainly negative, but it isn't all negative. I mean, we can draw from what came before us. and. I, I believe that my time spent studying and learning and going to ceremony, et cetera, you know, amongst the Lakota taught me the positives mm. of relating to the ancestors. And what about the ancestors that's beyond this planet? I mean, because we are all hybrids, right? We're not, not just from here, we're from many different places. And if anything, we are the real melting pot. So what about that? I've always been curious about how that ancestry shows up. I love that question because I'm really big into that. I don't always get to talk about it in public a lot. You know, I do in my Welcome classes. Welcome to Dare to Dream. <laughs> I know, I love it. But I do in classes because people start asking about that. You know, we're all sort of odd and there we are and they're like, and then I start talking about the Pleiades and Orion and this and that and the ancient ones and, you know, and there we're going. That I believe we're still guided by those ancestors. like. The Cherokee um, Voices of Our Ancestors is a book I love. It's written by a Cherokee uh, wise woman, and it's about how they her ancestors came from the Pleiades and brought their truths, and the elders stay here, and here's how they still connect with them. So um, I remember being in Peru and buying cloth. I've got it somewhere in this place, but you can't see it, I don't think. Um, but buying cloth from the Shipibo Indians and it's really just a, a series of mazes that they say tracked their stars. You know, it's like how they find their way back to their star people. So we're a mix of all of that. I think many of those cultures are still available. I think they're obviously a lot of them more advanced than us. And I love it when I get more in touch with what I've been able to be or do in a different planet. Mm 
And I think most many sensitives I work with don't find a really comfortable way to be on this planet, mm -hmm. ironically, until they connect to their like original star or original constellation. Once they've remade that connection, that energy from there, because it's not like our normal elements, can come into them. And then again, it's kind of paradoxical, they're better able to be here because they have that they have their bond, they have their community. Every single time I've help, helped somebody connect to where, you know, what they're missing from out there, they're better able to function here. They're not just in pain about being stuck here or not fitting here. Is that the part uh, in your um, bio about destiny or is yeah. that something different? I think so, it is, because I think destiny is a continuation of who we really are. And it's how we go forward with it. But you're not going to do your destiny, which we tend to think is, oh, I'm going to be an opera star or I'm going to be a healer. I'm going to be blah, blah, blah. Right. I think destiny is about being who we are. And then that creates the path forward mm -hmm. to be who we are. We have to collect. They're like comets behind us. Right. We have to collect that stardust, that that other earth energy and somehow invoke it. And then I think destiny opens up for us. Then we find our place on this planet. Maybe we're gonna be a farmer. I, I don't know. Like people ask me, what do you think you're gonna be doing in 10 years, Cindy? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Where do you think you're gonna live? I don't know. And I don't, I don't tend to worry about it. Um, but I do get dreams about the future, but really only for my kids because I'm still helping them make it. You know what I mean? It's sort of a service piece. Um, but I feel like like if we gather who we are, it opens that pathway forward. Powerful. Uh, pets are animals. Uh, can we, I mean, I already know this, we can communicate with them, but I would like you to go deeper into what feels like a pedestrian idea. Um, because I, I know that I am I know everything my dog wants, needs, there's no doubt. Some people, you know, there have been situations where people have found her, let's say in a bathroom. She's just sitting there and like, what is Shelby doing sitting in the bathroom? I said, Oh, she wants to go in your tub and drink the water. I just know what I know what I know. So um, and I love her for it for letting me in at that level and making it so easy. But what is that all about that? like wordless connection, so yummy. It's so soul to soul. I love the Hopi, one of the Hopi creation stories that Frank Waters wrote in uh, his book about the Hopi, where, you know, kind of the first stage, we've had four ages, say the Hopi. The first stage, here come plants, here come animals. Then we came. Well, they're much wiser. <laughs> They started it all. They were in what he called a blueprint with the divine. They knew their wisdom and they were there to help teach us. We have to tend to them, but they're here to teach us. And most likely some of the original people learned, right? Made some connections and bond and were willing to learn from the plants and the animals and the seas and the clouds and whatever. But the way he told it, tells it is at some point, you know, we started listening to the dark and then where we had one heart, which was in a blueprint with the divine, we developed two hearts. Mm -hmm. So we have a light heart and a dark heart. And I think the animals for most of us or reptiles or the species, you know, the beings, the souls we attract, there's a bond there. There's a, we're helping them be who they are. We have to support them in their teachings and their learnings. They're here also to teach us. There might be karmic bonds where, I mean, my current dog, Lucky, I think was my dog, Muffy, when I was growing up. And Muffy didn't have a good life because my mother stuck poor Muffy out in the backyard all the time. Lucky runs the house. Lucky's in the bed. Lucky, Lucky's got it made. And my current dog, Honey, the golden retriever, is actually an alien. I mean, he's an alien. He, he, there's a huge backstory around him, but he barks. He barks all the time. And he's always talking, and I know what he's saying. I had a girlfriend staying here one night. He came downstairs to sleep with her because he likes to downstairs. She heard him in the night making these noises. She saw these huge beings 
next to him, like long beings he was talking to. Like he's an alien, he's an alien. I, I mean, he looks at me out of the corner of his eyes sometimes like, you know, I'm not from here. You know, I know a lot more than you know. So I, I just say be open because often it's a heart to heart bond. So they get to us with senses and feelings and vibration. So, you know, it's more than just words, obviously. And, you know, let yourself figure out why they're there for you, like what they're teaching and what your job is in their lives. I mean, it's fascinating. They're fascinating. What your job is in their lives. That's great. People are always trying to figure out what their animal's job is for them. And animals, do, you know, dogs especially love a job. But yes, what is our job as well? I like that. A role reversal there. You have an upcoming class, Cindy, Advanced Apprenticeship Program, Energetic Mysteries. What is that? <laughs> well, that's one of my weird classes. <laughs> it's very fun. It's pretty much open to anybody who knows, you know, all the basics of energy and this and that and the other thing. And I lead a regular apprenticeship program every year. It's like an eight, nine month study of all energy and the gifts, et cetera. And then I like to once a year do an advanced apprenticeship program. They're boring names because you're apprenticing to yourself. And every year I let the people in the advanced class pick the topics for the next year. So it's so cool you're asking about that because this year we're doing uh, what are the teachings of the light across time? What planets may, might we have come from? What are some of the Celtic and other mysteries? What are some higher ways to do word of knowledge and to channel you know, in, you know, other languages. So it, when I put it together, my business manager actually called me, goes, you don't do these things. Is, is this in your branding? I go, yeah, I do this all the time. <laughs> I said, it's not always written that way, but it's written that way this time. <laughs> he goes, now, do, especially during these times, COVID and et cetera, and who knows if it'll be over the lockdown will be over by the time you do the class do you attract people from all over the world are your classes hundreds of people are they intimate there's you know like i my apprenticeship program has about 140 people the the advanced class tends to have fewer than that right because it's like does everybody want to learn about other planets um, I do some teaching for the shift network and those classes were in the multi hundreds, really good group, wonderful, uh, wonderful people. I love working with shift. Um, some of the classes, like I do a local college class and now we're online. I think I only had 35 people, which was really fun because we'd sit there on zoom, right? With 30, 35 people, I, we were like, it was like having a campfire. Mm. Everyone got to know each other. They still meet. So I feel like it's just pretty across the board, depending on kind of what the class is. Okay. And every day, Cindy, do you have a ritual or a practice you use that helps you stay well, healthy, centered, grounded, and all that? Well, I use something I call spirit to spirit, which is very simple. I just always affirm my spirit. Mm. All the guiding spirits are the spirits of those who I'm going to meet, you know, their higher essences and the greater spirit. And I just turn things over. And then I grab an iced tea. It's 4.15 in the morning when I do this. I grab an iced tea. I put the dogs in the car. I drive to the dog park. And not in 40 below, but 10 below, we, we run. Well, they run. I walk. <laughs> so I'm a doer. I can't just meditate. I got to move. And then my day is good. And for folks who are interested in the class, Cindy was talking about, or her, she has a lot going on. You can check out her website, C-Y-N-D-I, Dale, D-A-L-E.com, Cindy Dale. So you put this beautiful, beautiful book, don't look at my dog ears, <laughs> out into the world, this book called Energy Healing, your latest book. What do you next dare to dream, Cindy? What are your future dreams and goals? Um... Well, I'm working on a couple other books and one of them is a sports book. I have this secret passion to help athletes. So I'm, I'm putting energy medicine into athletics and I'm, I'm, it's pretty, what's your past life issue, right? What forces? So I'm sort of just putting it all out there and we'll see what happens with that. And I have some other books too. So, uh, and I want a vacation. 
I'm dreaming about a vacation. <laughs> I want a vacation. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show, Cindy Dale. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, Debbie. Lovely. Yeah. I'm going to end today's show with this quote from Cindy Dale. One thing missing in alternative metaphysical or AMA approved healthcare excla exclamations of healing endeavors has been a clear picture of the human energy system, a picture of not only the spiritual or material sides of our being, but of these revolving doors between the material and the spiritual realms. Do subscribe and leave us a comment. I read them all and get back to you to this number one transformation conversation, the Dare to Dream podcast. Next week on this show, world-renowned astrologer Susan Miller is back again. And if you're listening to the podcast and you'd like to see what we look like, myself and the guest, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality.